They're hacking the curtains up here. Okay, so that's good. Yeah, so you can see the screen. So should I start or should I wait for the elves to hack the curtain? I guess I'll just start here. Okay. So I'm Rodney, and um, I'm going to talk about security analysis of Skype. And uh, hopefully you all can see the screen and such. Okay, so standard introduction comments. Um, so my name's Rodney Thayer. I'm a security analyst, which means I spend a third of my time writing exports, exploits, a third of my time terrorizing vendors from the inside doing product evaluations, and a third of my time terrorizing vendors from the outside doing architecture consulting and stuff like that. Um, anyway, so why look at Skype? Well, it's a voice over IP kind of a thing, even though it isn't directly voice over IP. So it's an area I've been looking at voice things. Um, and it's very popular. This all came about before eBay bought them. So I'll get to that at the end. Is there any kind of a problem? Well, I don't know of any problems. I found some disgusting things that are going to lead to problems, in my opinion, but I haven't actually found any you know, exploits out there in the wild or anything like that. Am I going to help the bad guys? You always put these things in these hacker slides, right? So I don't think I'm helping the bad guys. I always assume I'm lazier and stupider than the bad guys, and you should really basically be afraid anyway. Uh, and so I don't really think this is going to teach them anything. Um, disclosure policy. So I didn't find any zero days. I didn't find any exploits. I didn't find anything I thought I should report to Skype. Uh, I found a bunch of stuff that sucks, but, you know, if I call them up and say, hi, I think this feature sucks, you know, that's not a bug report, so I don't think that's actually valid. So I don't think there was anything that should have been told to them. Um, another thing is sort of the way I, I evaluate these things. When I do a product evaluation, I do these as my living, um, I take some level of how much energy I put into it and how lazy I think that a hacker would be. And part of the point, in my opinion, is how little work you could get away with to actually find something. So I didn't you know, spend 300,000 hours and have a team of 40 people doing an intense protocol analysis or anything like that. Uh, so there is a certain amount of, you know, what if the tire kickers just tried to look at this stuff? What if you did a net stat on your computer while a call was happening and saw that you were doing a telephone conversation with Latvia, which I have on the screen here, you know, that kind of thing. So if the hackers could find it, I figure we should check it out. I'm not trying to protect against whoever the bad guys are this week, whichever country we're not in love with. I'm trying to you know, deal with the sort of street-grade criminals. Your average homeless person doing a hack, that kind of thing. Um, hey, some homeless people. Uh, when I moved to California, the first thing I saw was some homeless guy you didn't really want to be within 50 feet of because of the way he smelled walk into an Internet cafe to check his email. So, okay, I'm in California now, definitely. So, Three ways of looking at it, as I said I do. One is if I'm doing an end-user evaluation. One is if I'm doing an engineering evaluation. And one is if I'm a hacker. Uh, so if I'm an end-user, I'm assuming that you know, I work for the CSO, and they said, here's this thing, go check it out, see what you think. Uh, so the out-of-box experience, that's what OOB stands for, is out-of-box. Um, you download this thing off the net, that's fairly reasonable. From the point of view of an end user, if you're an enterprise, it kind of sucks that the file name is Skype download.exe. They never put the rev number on it. And they've been revving this thing fairly frequently. They clearly have active development. Um, so it's okay. They use a standard kind of an installer for Windows. I did only the Windows version. I actually don't know what else their stuff runs on. I, I didn't bother to look. I was just trying to check the whole thing as a big picture, and I know it runs on Windows. I know it runs on Macs now that I think about it because I have somebody I talked to through it. Um, they have a test call capability, so you can test the product after you downloaded it. A lot of vendors don't do that kind of thing. So, for example, this guy was talking about the content inspection stuff. You know, what do you do to test this? You know, pick your favorite disgusting porn site and try to go there in front of your boss? I don't think so. You know, it's nice to have some sort of test capability. I mean, you know, when I do content inspection, what I say is, uh, it's illegal to buy chocolate between 10 and 11 in the morning, because that's very office safe kind of a comment to make. I don't talk about porn. Um, in this case, you know, who do you make a phone call to? Who are you going to harass at 3 in the morning when you just installed this thing? So they have a test call. It's kind of cool. Um, they don't have very many privacy warnings. So if your mother installs this or your sister who's really hot looking or whoever, um, you know, it turns on a bunch of things that I think are really bad from a privacy point of view. So I think it would be bad there. I've got screenshots we'll go through here later. Their use of audio is kind of dodgy. This, this, is the, this is an enabling technology for buying microphones and headsets and Bluetooth and all this other crap to plug into your Windows machine. It turns out that's a whole other category of device drivers that don't work very well. So I've now learned to install and deinstall Bluetooth many, many times on this computer, and I've bought nine headsets since April because they just fall apart. If you, you know, if, you go to, if you go to the local electronics store, buy the $4 headset, carry it around in your backpack to two or three conferences, it'll break in about three weeks. Um, so, you know, this is kind of an enabling technology, which is cool, but then we get into looking at all the audio drivers and all the things that could have as problems. And I saw some things there we'll talk about. There's a chat service, and they do have some sort of encryption, so it's effectively encrypted chat. So if you want to send, you know, company secrets out the door that can't get past the content inspector, use Skype, don't use IM. 
provisioning. So what does it take when the thing's set up? Um, there's a bunch of information leakage. There's no warnings to the end users that they're doing this stuff. And it generates a signal when you go online. Now, everybody does this with IM and a bunch of other tools. We don't normally sit around shouting about it. I think that's a bad thing, and I think we should be aware of it and talk about it more. You know, you log on to AIM, and it, you know, everybody you know has a little message pop up that says you just logged on. So I know your sleeping habits, you know, when you were in the building, when you're out of the building. If I trace the IP addresses, I know where you were. All your, all your movements can get tracked, and there's you know, a whole bunch of things being leaked there. And this is fine you know, if it's just us paranoid wackos sitting in a hotel in Nashville. But you know, as soon as we hear a stalker story that somebody's figured out how to attack every 22-year-old blonde female in Berkeley, we're all going to be really worried about this. Um, so I think it's an issue we ought to figure out how to manage. All right, here's some pictures. Um, you can see the pictures more or less. I could, I run, for the testing purposes, I ran this in a VMware image inside a Windows machine. And VMware somehow decided that shift print screen wouldn't work, so I didn't do the normal thing you do in a presentation of taking pictures. So I whipped out my digital camera and took pictures of the screen. So they're at an angle because I was getting the flash to not hit it. This is a very ghetto kind of thing, but notice I still have the information. And it also fits the strategy. You know, this is what a hacker would do. He'd take a picture of the screen and send it to his friends and say, what can we do with this? So if you look at the screen, the default setting for privacy is anybody can call me. Just, hi, I'm there in the world, go talk to me. And anybody can chat with me also. So you want to drop kitty porn in somebody else's computer? Send the images through. You know, there's all sorts of obnoxious ways of looking at this. And it's just, these are the default settings. There's no warning. It just does it. You'd have to be paranoid enough to go through and look at this stuff uh, in order to find out this is happening. So I consider this a security problem. Now, this level of set the default so your grandmother could use it, you know, kind of thing. This is common. I think that's a bad thing that this is common. And I think, you know, this has got to be pointed out. Somebody has a wire they're waving at me. Yes. What do you want to do? You want to jack into what? Uh, S -video, video to that. Fine. What is this going to do to my computer? He's yeah. plugging something into my computer. It'll do nothing, he says. <laughs> Honest, it'll do nothing. So you have to understand, I'm the guy who runs the program committee for SmooCon, and there actually is somebody who, gave it, who is trying to give a talk that says, if I plug this object in your computer, I can do the following set of amazing things to you. Um, now, S video is not one of the paths he could use, so I'm assuming this is not going to do something disgusting. Uh, I don't know if you're getting any signal. Yeah. Have a good time. Okay, fine. We're just being technical up here. All right, here's another one. This is the information that gets shown in your directory. I cut off the top of the screen in the picture. It's not this thing. Um, the information above the gray lines is what gets displayed by default if you fill it in on the public directory. So you get your name, your birthday, your gender, all your phone numbers, your home page, which is a public thing, so that doesn't bother me, about me, whatever you want to type in here. So you find, like, I don't know, if you look on Friendster or uh, Orkut or some of these friend services, people will put the most amazing information leakage kinds of things. Hi, I live here. I like dogs. I drive a Ferrari, you know, whatever. Um, so again, this is all information leakage stuff. Some of this is not news to Skype, but Skype is committing the same sin as other vendors or other implementations. Uh, and you know, don't fill any of this stuff in. You know, put John Smith, you know, put Joe Hacker or something there and make your birthday, you know, over 21 years ago so if somebody looks at this when you go to a porn site, it's okay. Uh, but, you know, whatever. Don't, don't put anything real in this stuff. So, all right, calls. You can make calls with this. That's the point. So it's a telephone. So it changes people's ways of looking at things. Um, this is true of all voice over IP products, but I have to be talking about Skype specifically. Um, so it sort of did some evaluation, some quickie stuff, and then we'll talk about the security things. The audio is dodgy. Uh, it fades in and out. You can lose the signal, something, you know, it's that kind of stuff. It's probably an artifact of their file sharing mechanism. The call process, you click call. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you click call when you didn't know you were clicking call because you thought you were right-clicking to change the screen. So you can make calls accidentally. That's fine unless you call somebody in the middle of the night and it actually rings their computer, you know, on the other side of the room. How many people leave their machine on all night, right? You know, it's on the other side of the room. You really want me calling you at 2 in the morning, 4 in the morning, 9 in the morning, whatever you consider the middle of the night, um, that kind of thing. Um, it's sensitive to network load. This thing is basically Kazaa for audio, uh, so that's sharing all over the place, which is a shock and bad thing in and of itself. But that means it's sensitive to the network load. So it's not that me and the service provider have to both have our machines have their act together about being on the network. It's me and whatever person in Florida with a Comcast connection that they've decided to send me through. All that has to work. So your network is continually changing, and so it's kind of bopping up and down and kind of flaky. Now, this isn't really a security thing, but if I was on eBay bidding on 
you know, something that I'm really dying to get the bid on and I'm doing an audio connection and it was trying to, and the network started flaking in and out of the phone call, that would be a problem. Um, it drops calls sometimes. It's probably also the network kind of stuff. The call quality vaguely relates to a thing I call the suckometer, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, so you can kind of watch it, but you can't really manage it very well because it's, you know, it's designed to give away free phone service. It's not designed to be for old corporate use or something for business. I'm not sure what their pitch looked like when they sold it to eBay since they were all about you know, peer-to-peer -peer stuff before. And you know, people will have an opinion to say, hey, it's free. You know, why are you bitching? It's free. Um, you know, and that you know, kind of is okay and kind of isn't. So when you make a call with Skype, if you haven't seen the screen, down at the bottom, it says how many users are online. So when I did this, there were 3,848,946, no, 948 users online. My experience is if it's above 2 million, you'll get flaky phone calls. And I don't know if that's really 3 million people using it or this number is right. I've had phone calls with other Skype users. Well, I'll read the number to them, and they'll read the number to me, and we'll have different numbers. So, you know, in real time, it should be the same number if we're really counting the same thing. So it's not clear what that value is, but it does seem to correlate with phone quality. And the higher number, the worse it is. Um, so this number gets used later if you're trying to think like an attacker. All right, problems. Calls get dropped. The microphone will switch on during calling. I have seen this. I have not been able to reproduce it. You call somebody else. For them, they hear ring, ring. For you, during the, you hear ring, and then it switches to playing their microphone. So if somebody's sitting there talking and not answering your phone call because they're in the middle of something, you get to hear them anyway. So this is an interesting thought. Now I've got starting to think about, oh, I could build an attack that did that. I now have a way of bugging your office or your house or your bedroom or whatever. Um, you know, but they have this, some kind of software bug in there. Sometimes the calls don't end after voicemail. So I've had a case, cases, multiple cases from multiple people. They'll call. The call doesn't go through. goes to Skype's voicemail if you buy the voicemail option. And then after they record the voicemail message and they hang up, it doesn't really hang up for them. So it starts tapping their conversations. So basically, you know, sort of the, the lesson here is if we're going to use audio, I really wish we had power switches in all the microphones. You know, these things have power switches, but the little cheesy $3 thing you buy at Radio Shack, there's no extra switch. I really wish I could really physically turn the microphone off. And that's all fine if I have my awful, evil, Intel-based Windows machine up here so I can unplug the wire from the side and pull it off. If I have that gorgeous thing over there with the fruit in the front that the man who's behind the, t the camera is using, that has a microphone built in. I don't know how to physically switch that microphone off. Now, maybe they can. I just don't know how to do it. But, you know, if the mic's built into the PC, you've got an issue there. All right. So end user-wise, sort of what's my security conclusion? It leaks information. It's flaky. It's got these audio bugs floating around, which could be the drivers and could be them. It's free, and so everybody can use it. I can't block it inside a corporation by saying, we won't buy a copy of this for you. Uh, people just you know, slide into the network. So people are going to think about policy enforcement for this stuff. The chat is encrypted, so it's kind of dangerous instant messaging kind of stuff. You can do chat and exchange secrets and send passwords and do things, and nobody's going to catch it. Um, and so, you know, it's got some issues. It's got some significant issues. This list, if you put in front of a CSO, they quite well might get upset about people using it in an enterprise environment. You know, and if you guys, you know, you people who go to conferences like this, presumably you're the CSO for everybody in your family, whether they like it or not, right? So, you know, would you let your mother use this? I don't know, you know, with credit card numbers and things like that. It's kind of, kind of scary stuff. Certainly enterprise environment is kind of scary. All right, engineering point of view. So... I've been doing this since the mid-70s. Yes, I've been writing code since most of you were born, uh, since before most of you were born. Um, so when I look at products like this, I will think about it like how would it be built or what does it imply that's about the way that it's got built. Sort of like you bring in a carpenter, an old carpenter, to go look at your house and they go, oh, the studs are too close together on that wall. I can tell by the bumps in the curtains or you know, something like that. So you can go through and you can start to evaluate things like this. You know, some punk-ass bitch in Germany who's drinking Jolt Cola and, and you know, trying to hack into the United States networks you know, won't think like this, but anybody who's got any sophisticated level of development experience will look at this as an attacker. So the way the application was built, they assumed you didn't care about privacy. So that's their low privacy, assume the defaults kind of thing. So that's kind of a, it says something about their attitude and the whole thing. So like, I don't trust them to save the password correctly on my machine or their machines. Um, they don't quite get Windows stuff right. Some of the windows are modal, some are not. So they don't, they don't seem to have quite follow the Windows spec. So this implies there are, they're alien to the Windows environment, therefore their application may be built inappropriately and there may be potentially flaws in it, you know, when they do or don't use things that they, shouldn't, they should control. Um, the way they do the whole startup thing, it leaks information. So if it leaks the stuff I can see about logins, 
I don't know what it leaks that you can't that I haven't found because I haven't done a protocol analysis yet, but that implies there's a whole bunch more there. Um, and it uses resource theft as a network as a you know as a network use model. So this is the standard file sharing thing about you know you know same thing with BitTorrent. You can flow through my machine to get somewhere else. So my my reaction to that I mean there's there's the polite one and the impolite one. The polite one is I'm paying for the link. Why am I giving it to you? The impolite version is, uh, you know, whoever with you is the expensive car in the parking lot, you need to share now. The Lexus down there, I get to use it next weekend. You know, I mean, you wouldn't say that, but people will expect you to share their networks. And, you know, that's kind of a weird thing to do in a private environment. It's certainly outrageous in an, in, in an enterprise environment because you're stealing from your employer. And, you know, depending on their point of view, that could be worse than looking at porn on their network. Um, you know, of course, the obnoxious version you'd say at DEF CON is, you know, all the guys in the room, every one of you has a pretty girlfriend, you have to share. You know, you're not going to do that. Um, all right, here's the login. This is what I mean by uh, their privacy assumptions. There's a checkbox here that says log on this user automatically when Skype starts. That's checked every time you start the system. You cannot stop it from doing that. You cannot say, just don't give me that option. So unless you carefully uncheck the checkboxes before you log in, you're going to get connected all the time. Continue, you know, so you'll, you'll start leaking information even if you know enough not to, unless you carefully go through this process of every time you start the thing. So the fact that they would do that and they don't have options to stop that sort of thing tells me they aren't thinking about users' privacy. All right, resource usage. It's kaza. It's the same kind of thing as the, you know, not kaza, whatever the other one was that it was based on. Um, so it's this whole file sharing, whole model that they can go out and connect to the other neighbors and things. They don't directly go back to the service. So they just assume you want to share. They don't directly document this in the product anywhere. So it doesn't actually say this in the end user documentation. It's just if you know the history and you go look at your network and watch what's going on. The thing about this is imagine what's going to happen when you get on this and your IT department discovers you have TCP connections to Taiwan or Latvia or you know, whatever weird place it connects you to. So you're going to look like you're doing something bad or potentially, depending on their, how they're, they're looking at their network, if they're actually monitoring things. And you don't even need con content inspection stuff. You just look at the IP addresses. So this is kind of a security thing, I think, that's a, that's a problem. And yes, I'm being paranoid, but that's what people pay me to do. So... This is uh, my machine connected actually from the hotel room upstairs. So last time I could tell, there's probably some U.S. nodes between here and Latvia, so I find this is interesting. So I was connected to watch.svnets.lv, and I had to go look up that LV was Latvia um, through an SSL connection, so I have no idea what it was doing. Uh, and this is just the way Skype works. So I don't know if you've ever been to Latvia, but it's a really dodgy kind of a place. It's you know kind of pretty old country. It you know it was the thing the Russians put in the front line so that if anybody was cannon fodder when the Americans came through, it was Latvia. Uh, so it's got interesting laws. This is not where you want your bits traveling, if you had a choice. Uh, so but you know that kind of thing it does all the time. Mode so it. I, I had to play games to get this screenshot, um, but it basically does a bunch of connections trying to talk to somebody else. If you just looked at this and you didn't know you were doing Skype, this sounds like you've got an exploit running on your computer and it's trying to like, infect the rest of the universe. So this could generate enough of a signal for certain kinds of IDSs to decide that you're a bad person and should be shut down. Um, so you can have like the IT dude showing up on your doorstep you know, with a 45 pointed to your keyboard um, you know, if you want to do that. Uh, so, you know, it's, but that's the nature of the thing. And this is not documented that they do this. They just, hi, we do this. So, you know, you, you know welcome. You wanted to share, didn't you? All right. Uh, engineering things. It leaks privacy unless you control it and that whole check the checkbox thing. That's really uncomfortable to have to use. You know, I don't want to have to teach all my users to do that. I don't want to have to do tech support for my mother to tell her to turn off the checkbox yet again. Um, it's a file sharing app. It basically will look like that to d intrusion detection products that are trying to check for this sort of thing. So this ends up being like a poster child for policy enforcement. So I haven't seen anybody say this yet, but there are classes of products out there where they say, oh, we enforce a certain policy for your enterprise or for this network that we, we run, and uh, you aren't allowed to run these kind of applications or you aren't around, allowed to run this specific program. So this is the kind of thing people are going to think of blocking once they sort of really look at the guts of this. And, by the way, I didn't look at the protocol because the protocol is not documented. Um, now, there's sort of the, the really extreme view is if it's a non-standard protocol and it's not documented, then it's insecure until proven otherwise because I have no reason to assume other, you know, any other thing. The only people who are going to analyze the protocol 
are the bad guys because that's the only people who are going to sit down and take the time to unwind this thing far enough to figure out if they can find the crypto keys or figure out what the messages mean or figure out what you can tell from the traffic. Um, that ends up relating back to the issue about privacy. If they're sloppy about checkboxes, they'll be sloppy about where they keep the keys because whoever's coding this doesn't think about security. They're clearly not security literate. Um, and so I would tend to, I'm worried that the keys are lying around on my disk somewhere in the clear and if, you know, I'm going to read on Slashdot in somewhere in the next six months that somebody's figured out how to unwind this whole thing and tap my phone sessions. Uh, so that's a, that's a risk. You know, I'm not guaranteed, but that's kind of a risk that could happen. All right, let's talk like uh, we're doing attack here. So I had to put something in from Serenity. Anyway, let's be bad guys. Um, okay, so the first thing I would do is do reconnaissance on the application. And the Windows app itself is, you know, it's buggy. Uh, you know, so it's likely to have problems somewhere. Um, and so, you know, it's running on Windows, and so we get the normal kind of exploit potential problems here. Um, you know, if it's, if it's got, you know, flaky behavior, then you could potentially, you know, the normal kinds of Windows things could happen. These media drivers, uh, you know, it was torture to get a Bluetooth headset to work. You know, I bought a brand new Jabra, really cool headset, you know, the thing that looks like you just went to a Star Trek convention if you're wearing it. So I could, you know, wander around and wave my hands like I'm doing here and, and talk on the phone. And the calls flake, you know, flake. Sometimes the drivers switch off. Sometimes the microphone dies. I think these are driver things, but that implies that the multimedia stuff has all not been exercised this way. So that implies there's an entire class of exploits available that are Windows apps, that Windows exploits that apply to multimedia devices like headphones and microphones and cameras. You know, the modern high-tech geeked out, you know, senior marketing dude in a big company is going to have their fancy laptop with their fancy wireless headset with their fancy camera so they can do s video conferences, all this junk tied in. And now imagine what happens if somebody can randomly switch that on remotely from somewhere in a foreign country or take over their machine and do the usual things you do when you take over a machine. Um, the configuration stuff, there seems to be things kept inside the machine. So if you stop and start Skype, it tries to reconnect to the... Uh, the last site it was connected to. So, you know, like in my case, it was connecting to some Comcast user in Florida. So, and I'm not picking on my friends from Florida. Really, I'm not. Um, anyway, so imagine this scenario. My machine w starts up using Skype, um, and it connects to that thing, and that's, in fact, a drug dealer. And the FBI breaks in and grabs their machine and runs end case and gets every possible IP address on it and decides to go subpoena all those machines. And they get my IP address, and they can figure out it's me. So suddenly the FBI shows up on my doorstep because some random person somewhere on the internet did a bad thing and they you know, knew my IP address at the time. I mean, there's some potential hairy things going on there if your configuration is saved. Now, that's a paranoid scenario, but you know, these things happen. If you're trying to think about the downside risk, this you know, could, could go on. All right, the infrastructure. Um, so let me show you this slide again. And thinking like a bad guy, there are 3,848,948 potential targets that I know and probably can get to at least some of them because my software is proudly finding their IP address and sharing it. If I can connect to somebody through my machine, that means I found some moron in the internet with open ports that can let Skype calls in um, if it works that way, if they can connect to them. I'm pretty sure when it goes through NAT, it's me connecting to them. and I mean, they can't call back in because I don't have, uh, you know, I don't have ports open, but somebody must have ports open and that's why they're sharing it that way. Um, so this is, you know, one, one man's, uh, you know, suck meter is another man's target list. Uh, so we've got, you know, we're, we're getting information here that, that it's really easy for the bad guys to use. That's somebody, that's a horn in the street. That's not the audio system collapsing around me, right? Okay. And again, back to this. This is all useful for attack. You know, I can, I can do identity theft if I can get your birthday and your gender and where you live and, you know, your zip code and stuff. So that's enough some places to, you know, get past you know, I need a new copy of my credit card because I lost it because I was in Nashville at a conference. Um, so you've got to be careful what you put on these things. And they don't, nobody tells you any of this stuff. So the bad guys, you know, could potentially surf, just surf the directory and find this information. The directory, by the way, I believe there's an API to access that. So you can write programs to scour the entire directory and just sort of pull all the stuff in and just get it yourself, even if you're not connected. Okay. Uh, so in the infrastructure, there's like these well-marked alternative targets you can get to. Who knows what the protocol exploits are? If it's a private protocol, experience tends to be that you get, um, you know, if there's a protocol that's not documented, it's probably got flaws because it hasn't been peer-reviewed. I mean, we, people don't just say that because, you know, they believe, 
you know, that, that the open source world is God or anything like that. It's, you know, if there's no peer review for a protocol, it's probably got bugs because they tend to happen that way. Um, what about protocol hijacking? What if, if I can connect to somebody else's machine because I'm doing Skype, what if I do that as a bad guy? So now I've got an IP address of somebody's Comcast connection. What if I call on that UDP port and send them 500,000 null bytes? What's their machine going to do? Uh, you know, is this stuff got error correction for that? You know, all the kind of usual protocol attack weird stuff you could do. Um, and then if you really could connect to it, you could potentially hijack the connections and do something else. The, you know, sort of the gold ring would be, uh, you know, can I make a phone call acting as another Skype user and then do a death threat to a federal judge, which is the maximum possible way to incent law enforcement to go after your ass. Um, the directory thing, I talked about that, screw it, scouring that. Um, you know, that's the thing in the voice world is what if I could make a bad phone call? What if I could call 1-900 bad word or do it from the CEO's phone or something like that? Um, so people always try to hijack phone calls. All right. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, you know, exploit enabling technologies here. Um, I've got a phone that's on the public internet. The phone number's on the public net. Anybody can find this and somebody could call me. So what if somebody calls on my Skype phone and says there's Skype tech support and I have to type in the following commands because I want them to, because uh, they're doing some kind of maintenance operation and they proceed to teach me how to FTP something, my, you know, my Quicken files to their server or something like that. You could do phone phishing. And people are, you know, there are social engineers out there that all they need is a conversation. They could start doing that. Stalking. I used to think it was politically incorrect to talk about stalking, and I discovered that most, peop most people haven't thought of this. Is someday some bad person is going to use the Internet to harvest the demographics of whatever victim they want. You know, adult males who own Lexuses who have accounts at Wells Fargo who therefore have enough money so that they're worth ripping off, or 22-year-old blonde females who live in Berkeley, California, or something. So if you've got a mechanism like this, you, you're providing a facility people could potentially use for stalking. So you get that that's, you know, yucky to talk about, but it could happen. So you try to worry about this. The whole identity theft thing. If you, people leak information all the time. It's not news to Skype. It's not a Skype-specific thing. Uh, but it's in this, and so if we're trying to talk about it's the Skype security, that's one of the risks. Um, you're stealing network resources. So all those ports are open, so all that traffic is supposed to be happening. So after the IT guy shows up on your desk and says, you're doing this evil stuff because I saw you talking to Latvia and because you're all good social engineers, you teach them to open up enough ports so that they let that stuff happen. Well, now we get more ports open for traffic flowing out and therefore that might cause problems and be a place you can get network resource theft. You know, I can steal, I can steal the traffic for something else. Since it's all encrypted gook, we don't know what it looks like, so we don't know what anybody else's traffic would look like. So we don't know that it's Skype traffic going over those ports. We just know it kind of looks like Skype traffic. Um, then you get sort of this, the social engineering things, which is phone phishing is, that, you know, the fake, you know, things like the phishing attacks, but there's all the other classes of stuff. You could get somebody's phone number and call them and, you know, all the kind of phone scam kind of stuff could potentially do that. All right. Um, I thought up a few exploits. Haven't written any of these things. Uh, been trying to think about this, mostly as a general matter for voice over IP in general, but specific to Skype, certainly. What if I can turn on the microphone? If I can really turn on the microphone remotely, if that's one of the bad things I could do to your computer, uh, that makes your computer into a bug uh, in, an off in your office, in your house, whatever. Um, I hadn't thought about that until I saw Skype fail at doing that. I just assumed people would get that right. Uh, that seems like an obvious thing since you're using a multimedia device. I thought that was obvious to make sure that code works. Clearly, they don't think it's obvious. Um, and so that's a potential here. You know, every time you add a device that, you know, if it's your computer and it's just sitting there when you're not in the room, it's just sitting there. Whereas if it's a computer and it's got a microphone or a camera or some other device that can actually act, you know, basically, you know, you're in everybody else's house or everybody else's office. So that's kind of a big deal to think about, you know, that, that angle of things. Um, plus, it's the phone code. So Skype, you know, Skype gives away the application for free. Uh, a lot of the soft phone services for, other, for the commercial voice over IP kind of mechanisms have really cheap uh, soft phone packages. And so we've got a cheap software package running on Windows, designed to be given away for free or something like that, and therefore is going to have the kind of engineering budget that goes with that and the kind of QA budget that goes with that. So the conditions are perfect for people to build bad code with bugs in it and then distribute it to thousands of people who don't know how to protect themselves. So this is your standard conditions to have some sort of you know, bad problem rip through that community or that set of users. Um, <coughs> there's calls and chats and stuff. 
if you can get to the victim machine, what if I sent bad stuff? I mean, this, it's another chat mechanism. There's all the garbage that goes along with chat about sending bad URLs or sending JavaScript or sending something bad down the line to, the, to this chat window. And it's encrypted. I mean, even though it's proprietary, it is encrypted with their mechanism. And therefore, any kind of defense mechanism you have is not going to see this and not going to be able to stop it. So that, that's another interesting path. You know, take all your favorite IM attacks and try to pump them through Skype. Then the protocol, I mean, the protocol is not documented, so in the process of reverse engineering it, people may find things. Um, the other reason I didn't try to reverse engineer it is because starting to attack the Skype server directly seemed a little rude. Um, and since it's a service, I can't get my own Skype server to try to run. So that, you know, there's potential there for protocol hacks. It's not like I know there are any, but that's certainly a path to look at. Then there's the DOSing attacks, so you know, denial of service. I didn't spell it out correctly. Um, if I'm, you know, I get, I do a network monitor on my machine and I see all these machines I'm talking to and sending UDP traffic to. So, okay, there's another port that's interesting to send 10,000 null bytes to, you know, which is a really cheesy, stupid little trick. You can do that with Netcat or any sort of little tools, little simple tools, and it's embarrassing the number of times that actually catches things. Um, so, the, you know, the, the, the obvious kind of just sit on a machine, watch it do Skype, figure out the machines it's talking to, and just send them crap and see what they do. Uh, you know, they might fall over, they might not. And you don't know who these people are and you don't know where they are. And they don't know who, why you're talking to them, but they have their ports open, so the world talks to them all the time. So they expect to be talked to by strangers, and somehow they thought that would be safe, which is an amazing thought. But anyway, uh, you know, they didn't know they were doing this probably. Um, since you're doing all this network sharing stuff, you may end up bypassing your firewall effectively. I mean, you've got leakage going through because the firewall machines... You know, aren't stopping inbound. And they're, they're starting out, outbound traffic, the same speech the other guy gave. You know, if it's outbound traffic, there's not a lot of technology here to chase that. Um, if you're lucky or unlucky, depending on your point of view, an IDS would find this as a file sharing app because they do that based on the traffic. They don't do it based on the protocol. And they'd see you talking to lots of addresses and sending lots of data, and that's the criteria for file sharing. So, you know, if that's a bad thing you're trying to chase. So, you know, potentially you can bypass this if somehow they've been taught to, if somehow the IT security people are taught to detune this or not look for that. And you can potentially graffiti a machine, you know, put yucky stuff on it, you know, send images by chat or send URLs by the chat, or that kind of thing. So there's, there's a bunch of things you could do there to, to, to this thing. Um, and so anyway, I found a bunch of these things. Haven't really done any of them. Um, started to look at the microphone stuff a little bit. Uh, but if, if, you, if a casual view sort of going through this thing found this sort of stuff, that implies that sometime in the next several months there will be people catching this sort of thing. And, of course, Skype just got bought by eBay, and therefore now it's a really popular target as well as potentially a popular tool. All right. Um, and then last few things here. I'm um, a little ahead here. Um, update. So we're sitting at a, somebody's party at DEF CON, and they say, oh, what would you talk on at Freaknik? And I said, oh, how about... You know, what would you like? And they, somebody said Skype. So we started looking at this, and like a month later, eBay buys them. Um, I don't know if eBay knows what they got because, you know, there's undocking, there's pri proprietary code and, and it's audio. I'm not even sure that it makes sense to use Skype with eBay. I think part of the value of eBay is that I don't have to be in a real auction room because I hate auctions. You know, I don't want to raise my hand with some guy up at the front of the room talking real fast. Um, so I'm not sure why an eBay user would use Skype. You know, I don't really want to... Yeah. So the comment was that it, it was for questions and other, another, com, another communications channel. Yeah, and my reaction is some of the people, I, I, don't, I use eBay some, I don't use it a huge amount, and some of the people you buy from are a little strange, and I'm not sure I really want to talk to them on the phone. It's weird enough doing email with them. Um, so once again, I, I, I like the fact eBay is really anonymous, and I don't have to deal with you know, some 400-pound lady who lives somewhere in you know, North Dakota who sells you know, use Dell laptops as her living, and I happened to bid on one of her auctions. It's like, it's not clear you really want to be in contact with these people. So I think that they're forgetting their anonymity side. Now, maybe everybody else thinks it's great, and it'll be a wonderful thing, and they'll all think I'm a loon, and I'm sure that'll happen right up until the day an exploit comes out. And then, you know, somebody will go scour the net, and they'll figure out that, you know, this talk is one of those bad things that content inspector finds because it's research on hacking. Um, so anyway, um, vulnerabilities we're chasing, like I said, the microphone thing, um, the, the most interesting thing, I think, is the fact that you can, you can get the machines to go into these failure modes. Um, what I really want to do is get the Cisco soft phone to turn the microphone on, because that would be a really cool 
you know, kind of obnoxious kind of a problem. So taking some of the Skype failures and seeing who else has flubbed it also. Uh, it seems to me possible that it's not Skype. It's in fact, you know, it's the Windows world. So the way that works is you close your eyes, you check your brains at the door, and you call some dynamic link library that, you know, Microsoft wrote or somebody wrote, or you call a Java class. Or you do some kind of technical thing that you don't know what the guts of it does. So there could be flaws floating around that everybody would hit. You know, if it's in the audio code, if, like if it's in the Windows audio code that calls all the microphones, then, you know, the, every application could have this problem. You know, and until I got Skype and started playing with voice over IP about a year ago, I never had a microphone on these. I never bothered to buy a microphone for my computer. I, you know, I mucked around with it a little bit. And now I do podcasts and voice over IP conversations with people. And I've, you know, I've done conference calls from Europe back to Los Angeles and, you know, charged mon people money for the time. And, you know, it's, it's great. It's you know, really nice enabling technology. But it's another input device. You've got to think about it like a hacker. Think about it like a bad guy. It's another input device. It's another potential resource I can control remotely and do something bad with. You know, there are evil ways you can look at this. Um, so anyway, that's, so I think there's some stuff there. I think it's probably not necessarily the Skype code, although I think the Skype code is kind of crap. Um, anyway, lessons from looking at this. I never looked at the soft phones before. I had written text, you know, lecture texts where, I, you know, because I teach a voice over IP security class. So I'm, I would make the flip comment, oh, well, it's a Windows program, ha-ha, so it must have a problem, ha-ha. You know, you're supposed to, you're the teacher, you're supposed to put these things in your slides. Um, but now looking at the inside, of the, trying to use the Skype stuff and trying to think about it uh, a bit, I'm going to go look at all the soft phones because I basically don't trust any of them. My opinion of them, which was low, has gotten even lower uh, because, you know, this implies that that really is a good vulnerability path. And soft phones are not just used on... Um, on PCs these days, sort of the next generation of cell phones. How many of you have one of those Palm Trios, this you know, giant 400-pound object in your pocket to take phone calls on? Well, the next generation of that's going to run embedded Linux and have a voice over IP implementation partially based on open source code that was sold at an obscene price to some phone vendor. Um, so it's all the same category of technology as this. So if, you know, and, and if you go to the security folks and you say, okay, well, I could compromise every Windows machine with a soft phone, that's not an interesting population, relatively speaking. If I could compromise every phone in the singular network, that would be bad. Um, so you know, this is, implies that this is a place that we ought to be, be looking at this stuff. And if you look in the phone community these days, it's, a, it's one of the places where there's embedded system development, small machines, uh, resource-constrained environments, people selling millions of them, so the engineering budget is really low. So that, you know, they tend to outsource this to you know, somewhere in the middle of Russia where you know, they, they pay them with a, you know, a cup of water and a t-shirt a day or something, you know, whatever. Um, so there's lots of pressures to lower the cost and therefore lower the quality and not do any QA. And of course, then you, you know, the users are stuck because you, know, you want to call Skype on the phone. Try calling eBay security. I don't know if you've ever tried that. Everybody who's ever been ripped off buying a Pez container on eBay calls eBay security which means effectively they're under a continual denial of service attack. So if you have a real problem, you can't call eBay security. It just doesn't work. Um, we, we hit a thing. eBay also owns PayPal. PayPal's digital certificate for PayPal of Germany expired in October of last year. It stayed expired until April. They didn't actually catch this. Now, this is the Germans, and the Germans are compulsive about things. The reason it didn't get caught is because people kept trying to report it through eBay security, and you can't do that because it's just lost. You send them an email message, and you get lost in the blizzard. Um, I actually found that one, but I'm an HTCIA member. That's the cops and geeks kind of you know, organization. So I got a hold of eBay's physical security people and got them to get me in touch with the network security people through the back door and reported it. And funniest thing, once you told the geeks, it got fixed in the day. So it's not like they don't have clue. I mean, these are reasonable people. It's just they're under continued barrage of noise, and so they're not going to know anything. So if eBay buys Skype and there's a Skype exploit and somebody tries to report it, you know, you're going to have somebody standing up at a talk at, at Black Hat saying, oh, yeah, we reported it 53 times and got no answer, so the hell with them. We're just going to present it. You can just imagine this kind of scenario happening. Because, you know, eBay, eBay makes Microsoft security reporting look easy, I'm sure. Um, so that's sort of, you know, the other, the other thing there. Conclusions. So if I were doing this talk, you know, doing this evaluation and trying to talk to a customer about should they use this. So first thing is that soft phones is a new class of exploit target. And, you know, they go, oh, you're thinking like a bad guy. Well, yeah, I get paid to think like the bad guys. Um, but it's a new, it's a Windows app. It's got all these conditions that are right to be, you know, find problems in it. And I think that that's, you know, that's going to be a new round of things. And it's doing bad things in the machine, logged in as user mode, 
happens just fine with Microsoft XP Professional Service Pack 2 or whatever the latest and greatest and most safe copy of Windows is. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great you know, opportunity for hackers. And if I think things like that, I assume that the real hackers you know, kind of figured this out six to 12 months ago and they just, they're sharing their private zero days and we haven't seen them on the street yet. Uh, you know, and until ISS figures out how to make money telling us that they're there, we're not going to hear about them or, or you know, whatever. Fill in your, pick your favorite uh, you know, security company. Put in the, you know. Multimedia is still hard. I think that's the other thing is that the multimedia drivers are still screwed up. Um, you know, people got device drivers that tend to be written by third parties that have to work with Microsoft, which is a painful process. And then they're all trying to cut corners too. So there's a whole bunch of flaws in that process. Uh, and that's why, you know, a new kind of hardware comes out. And we always, you know, we're all getting glitches about what drivers, you know. How many DVD burners have you bought? I'm on my fifth one. Um, I finally stopped trying to pick them by, so by, by quality. I just walk into the computer store and pick the most expensive one I can stand to buy because it's probably got working drivers. So, you know, fl flaky things like that happen. So I think, you know, Bluetooth and fancy headphones and stereo headphones and, you know, buying a $8,000 stereo to plug into the side of your computer or plug into the S-Video port on the back of your computer, which I'm sure is doing nothing bad to my machine, um, you know, that that's the way things are going, and that's going to be harder and harder and harder. And then think about the digital rights management stuff. So if the soft phones are vulnerable and that you can do bad things and then I can get into your computer and turn off the DRM code, then, you know, not only will the person who owns the computer be pissed at me, but, you know, the RIAA or whoever is protecting their digital rights, or, or, you know, could potentially, you know, be involved. So this is a potential can of worms here and a nice, fat, juicy target. So it's really cool. You could get a really, you can pack a room talking about an exploit on this if you're at DEF CON. You know, so this is kind of, you know, categories of things you should think about. Um, I think Skype has risks. You know, even take, you know, assume everything I found was, was not really too bad, there's still a risk profile there. So it's a potential problem, and therefore it should be examined carefully and sort of worried about, and maybe not allowed, depending on your point of view. Um, soft phones have risks, and I don't know if it's more than, because there's a whole class of voice over IP phones now, the, you know, phone instrument, the normal thing you put in your desk. But it's got, those both have sort of exploits or, or potential vulnerabilities. I did a bunch of stuff with the Cisco phones, and I'm starting to look at other vendors' phones too. You know, and a, a phone these days is an object running TCP IP that costs $40 that is manufactured by the millions that's got ROM code in it that has a, an under-budgeted QA process. So it's a perfect environment to have network exploits. Yeah, it is inside the network, but, you know, imagine if I could exploit all the phones in your building. You know, imagine all the phones rang or stopped ringing or you were trying to call 911 or, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff there. So soft phones are probably just as bad as, as uh, hard phones. I don't know if they're worse, but, you know, at least just as bad. What would I do instead? I would go find a real voice over IP service with real protocols, with a real server somewhere that I'm connecting to, and use that. Uh, that's what I'd rather do other than Skype, now that I've sort of started to think about the guts of this. Because if I get that, if I'm using this for something where I'm paying money, um, you know, I've got a service with a service provider, and I'm connecting to their gear, and if something doesn't work, it's an argument between me and them, not me, them, and every hacker in Taiwan who has open ports on their computer, and therefore the sharing goes through them. You know, I connected to Taiwan a few times. I, I couldn't catch one of those on the screen. Um, it also means we should watch out for telephone attacks. So that's kind of interesting because the voice network is, the, the standard theology is the voice network is separate from the data network, even though it's all IP packets. Um, and so they don't put IDSs there. They don't assume a bunch of things. They don't expect viruses there. You know, I've got one customer trying to pay me to think about writing phone viruses, which should be hard. But, you know, a codec is just a de decompressor, and decompressors have been broken four or five times in the past two years, so why not? It's a path. Um, so phone attacks. I don't know how to watch out for phone attacks exactly. And, you know, you know do, you, do, do you call the help desk if you get a phishing call? I mean, do people, have, do people know enough to do that? Is that the kind of thing we end up teaching your users? And then we have to teach our users to do things because the machines can't catch them because you'd have to actually listen to the audio. So there's a whole bunch of possible problems here if you start thinking about the phones and the Internet and the hacking community getting together the bad way. There's a whole bunch of potential problems there that could you know, sort of hit you really hard. So anyway, that's about it. I think there's one. No, there's not one more slide. The slides will be at as soon as... Can you see that link? Oh, wow. It came out completely light blue. Um, okay. I will make sure that the slides are available somehow if you want to get copies of things. Anyway, so... That's it. You actually heckled me much less than I thought we would, so I allocated 10 minutes to the end, like it says in the spec, and I'm done 15 minutes early. All right. I'm done. Thank you.